most overcoming prayer that I ever prayed was for God to give me the strength, the courage, the knowledge, and a way to deal with my past before I lost my wife. Um, my most overwhelming prayer was a couple of years ago when our son was um, in the midst of active addiction. This kid who was raised in church, who served God, and who had given his life to God. And I had to pray that God would take him wherever he needed to go to get to where he needed to be to need God again. The most overwhelming prayer that I prayed um, was March 12, 2015. Um, Chris and I began having a conversation that made us realize we were disconnected and far apart from each other. We weren't making time for each other. We weren't um, planning date nights or even really communicating. Our marriage had just taken a backseat to everything going on in our lives. Um, there was never any infidelity or wrongdoing on anybody's part. We just were parenting and surviving. At that time, we'd been married almost 17 years, and I had never felt that way. I felt alone and scared. So that night, I sat outside on my garage steps, and I was just crying uncontrollably. I couldn't, I, I couldn't breathe, and I just prayed. <clears throat> it was overwhelming to me, and I just wanted my daddy so badly. Um, I wanted him to come and just wrap his arms around me and fix everything. I know that although my earthly dad is a source of comfort and strength for me, it was actually my father in heaven that I needed the most in that moment. I prayed for God to fix our marriage and get us through. Chris and I cried together and then we prayed together and spent the next few weeks working harder on our marriage than we ever had. The most overwhelming prayer that I've ever prayed was 16 years ago when I was walking in the uh, emergency room uh, thinking that, that my wife then uh, was just having an asthma attack and that a little treatment, some doctor's care and everything would be okay. Little did I know two hours later I would be alone in a, a family room praying to God as, as to what I was going to do and how I was going to tell my two children that their mother had passed away. So one of the most overwhelming prayers I prayed, this story begins in 2002 when I married my high school sweetheart, Nathan. And we, uh, several years later, we decided we wanted to start a family and we got pregnant right away and I had a really smooth pregnancy and everything went really well and we had a beautiful baby girl in January of 2005. And as many of you know, Lydia is such a joy to be around. Um, everyone around here loves her. And we had a great life together and we even brought a, a, bought a new home and decided we wanted to continue to grow our family. And once again, we got pregnant right away and things were going along. But in the first trimester, uh, we learned that I had miscarried. And I wondered why, uh, you know, I prayed, why would this be happening? We had done everything right. Everything seemed to be working the way it should be and just didn't understand. So as soon as we were cleared by the doctors, I um, got pregnant again. And um, but within several weeks, I knew something wasn't right and I miscarried for a second time. And uh, just, again, there's the questions, why God, why? I don't understand, I don't know how this could be happening. And I just became overwhelmed with despair, with grief, with depression. And so within several months, we decided to try again. And we were just certain that time, this was gonna be it, we're gonna have another baby. But within several weeks again, I began bleeding and I knew that I was having a third miscarriage. And so I just prayed this overwhelming prayer of just crying out to God in desperation to please save my baby, please. 
and I prayed for God, just do a miracle. I know you can do it. I know you can. I know you can do a miracle. But he didn't answer the, my prayer the way I had hoped, and I did have a third miscarriage. If you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn to the book of Matthew. This is the moment when Jesus is going to the cross and he goes through the garden, or what we call the garden, the Bible calls the place called Gethsemane, to pray. The Bible says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus is overwhelmed. You get that? I want you to just take in the brevity of that statement there by Matthew. Jesus is overwhelmed. Can we say that? I mean, is it okay to say Jesus and the word overwhelmed in the same sentence and it not be like Jesus the one fixing the overwhelming? But yet here we find Jesus is the one overwhelmed and not just overwhelmed, but overwhelmed to the point of death. This is not overwhelmed like I'm so overwhelmed and stressed out. I don't know how I'm going to get all this laundry done and get all these, these work, this work done and I'm so stressed out at work. And I, This is not that kind of overwhelmed. The word there is extreme distress or grief. And we would do well to learn from this because we should be careful how we use that word overwhelmed or stressed out. Because the stuff we get overwhelmed about, such temporary earthly pursuits, it may or may not get done. And if it doesn't get done, it's going to be all right. Life goes on, doesn't it? And yet, we still claim we are overwhelmed. But this overwhelmed, this is like my heart is being ripped out. Overwhelmed. Can we say that about Jesus? How, how is it that Jesus is overwhelmed? I mean, this is the Son of God, part of the Godhead. The one through whom all things were made and in whom, through whom, all things exist. He is the first and the last, Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And He's overwhelmed? This is the one who can say to that mountain, move from here to there, and it goes. This is the one who said, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow worry about itself. Each day's got enough trouble of its own. Don't worry. This is the one who, in Matthew 7, 15, said, or 7, he said, or excuse me, Matthew 11, he said, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and he's overwhelmed. This is the one who healed disease and made the lame walk and the blind to see, raised the dead, walked on the water, and said to the disciples in the midst of a storm, he said to this storm, peace be still in the storm. He can walk to into the middle of a hurricane and go whoop and boom, just like that. And he says to the disciples, where's your faith? The beginning, the end, the one through whom all things exist. And he is, how is it that he in this whole cosmos 
on this little speck of dust called planet Earth, in this little section of that planet called Gethsemane, how is it that he finds himself, the Son of God, overwhelmed? What could cause such a thing? For the all-perfect Savior. The next words give us a clue. He says, I am overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. That word death, Thanatos. If you're a, just side note, if you're a Marvel comic fan, you're awaiting the Avengers, new Avengers movie, the villain in that movie that's supposed to be the end all to destroy the universe, his name is Thanos. That's where they get his name from this word right here. Thanatos. The word means literally physical or spiritual death. But figuratively and much worse, it is separation from the life of of God. I want you to imagine that just for a moment. Complete separation from the life of God. Can you imagine? The truth is you can't. None of us can. None of us can imagine what total separation from the life of God is like. We are not humanly capable of doing such a thing this side of heaven. Oh, there will be a time in eternity at the judgment seat when it becomes reality. And I know many people like to ask, well, wait a minute. The life of God, if God was this and God was that, then where is He when this happened? Why does this happen? Why does this happen? Let me tell you something. If God was to remove His life from the cosmos, you would truly see chaos. Because it is only the life of God that is holding this broken world together. And you can blame him all you want, but if he was to take his life apart from this planet, you would truly see devastation. It is only by the life of God we are held together today. And I know we can, we can ask the question, well, what about the atheists? What about all the ones who reject God? It's kind of like the old army medic from World War II once said, in times of war, You'll never find an atheist in a foxhole. Because when life is at its most urgent, when life is totally at its worst moment, and we are staring at the brink of eternity, all of a sudden, everyone becomes interested in the faint, even the faint existence of a God. And what the atheist does not realize and it's only by the life of God they are able to make the claim that there is no God. Because it's the life of God that puts air into their lungs, breath into their lungs, and makes their heart beat and gets them up every day. It's only by the life of God they can claim that there is no God. It's only by the life of God that they have the free will to claim there is no God. So thereby proving by their denial of God that there actually is a God because it's the life of God that's keeping them alive. Why? Because as Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, 9, God desires that no one should perish but that all should come to repentance. And God is waiting and just hoping that one day they will yield and give their lives over to Him. But hear me, no one in their right mind, if they had any notion of what true life separated from God is like, no one would be fool enough ever to say there is no God. It's why Psalms 14 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God because it realizes how foolish it is to make such a claim. We have no idea what it is like to be separated from the life of God. And true, the atheist may not know him in their heart. He may not sit upon the throne room of their heart and their life may not be surrendered, but it's only by the life of God they can even make the choice. But there will be one day for us all in the atheists where it will be too late. And we all will face the reality of an eternity separated 
from the life of God. That's why I ask you today, do you know him? If you are here today and you are still playing with your eternity, do not play with that. Do not play with the reality of an eternity separated from the life of God. You need only take a look into the garden and see that the only thing that could overwhelm the Savior is separation from the life of God. You say, why is He going to be separated from the life of God? Why? Here's why. So that you and I might know the life of God. That's why. The Bible says he would go on to pray. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. That cup he's referring to? Revelation 14 tells us. This will give you a clue why Jesus is so overwhelmed. Not only is he going to be separated from the life of God so that you and I might know the life of God, but he is about to face the fullness of his wrath, the cup of his fury. The Bible says this, and this, hear me, if you're here today and you don't know him, you can know him. Why are you waiting? This is what awaits those who reject him in eternity. This is the cup of his fury that Jesus is about to face. Revelation 14 verse 9 says, A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on their forehead or on their hand, he or she too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast. No rest, no peace for anyone who receives the mark of his name. No rest, no peace, no nothing. Do not play with your eternity. If you reject him, if you're mad at him, if you're waiting, what are you waiting for? You can know him today, but do not mess with your eternity. Do not mess with the fury, the wrath of God. And the one who knew no sin is about to become sin. The sinless Savior is about to have all the sin of every single person who ever lived and ever will live poured onto him. That goes on from Hitler, Stalin, Jack the Ripper, to ISIS, to the church gossip, to the adulterer, to whoever, wherever, whatever. He's about to bear it all. The one who has never, though he knows the fullness of temptation, but yet never gave in to sin, is about to bear the fullness of sin. And God's fury, God is pouring his wrath out on sin through his son. Why? Because he loves you. So I don't care today whether you're mad at God, whether you question God. The one thing you cannot question is that you are loved, you are valued, and your life has meaning. And that's what Gethsemane tells us. Right in this moment. I don't care where you are, who you are. Get off your phone. Get off. Don't think about anything else. Because this moment exists because that moment right there. He loves you. And he faced the fullness of God's wrath so that you and I wouldn't have to. He paid our debt. He paid our penalty. He is about to be completely separated from the life of God so that we would know the life of God. And that's why he's overwhelmed. Luke puts it in a more graphic nature when he says, And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He is so overwhelmed, he's literally sweating blood. This is a medical condition called hematidrosis. It's a proven fact. It exists, but it's only been recorded a handful of times in all of history, and this is one of them. See, your sweat glands are surrounded by these blood vessels. And what happens, what can happen, medically speaking, when the body becomes so under duress and stress and grief that it cannot contain it anymore, it becomes to the boiling point that the human condition cannot bear, what happens is the blood vessels will burst 
And the blood from those vessels will refuse into the sweat glands and sweat through the pores of the skin. And it will literally look like you are sweating blood. Luke would want us to know that because he was a doctor. He would want to use that graphic description so that we would know just how overwhelmed Jesus was. But what I want to bring to your attention is the verse right before that. Look at verse 22. uh, Excuse me, Luke 22, verse 43. Right before that, it says, An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Now, I want you to understand. So an angel comes down and appears to Jesus and he strengthens him. And notice the very next verse. What's happening simultaneously. So the angel strengthens him. And then it says, and being in anguish. Say what? Wait a minute. The angel just strengthened you. And then it says, and being in anguish, Jesus prayed even more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood going to the ground. Wait a minute. If if God sends an angel, then it stands to reason everything's all right. Right? Right? That's what we pray for. God sent an angel so everything should be fine. But here the angel comes and Jesus, still in anguish, is so overwhelmed that his sweat is like drops of blood going to the ground. How can that be? Notice. It says, an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. It doesn't say an angel of heaven appeared and rescued him out of the situation. It doesn't say an angel from heaven appeared and took him out of there. An angel of heaven appeared and shielded him. That's not what it says. It says an angel of heaven appeared and strengthened him. A more logical prayer for me would have been, God, get me out of here. That's what we pray, right? God, get this off of me. But that's not what the angel does. The angel doesn't take Jesus out of the garden. The angel strengthens Jesus for the horror he is about to face. Here's the point. Sometimes God does deliver us by taking us out of the situation. But sometimes he delivers us by strengthening us and taking us through the situation. Because sometimes the storm is the point. Jesus, God is not always going to take you out of the situation. Sometimes He's going to give you the strength and deliver you not by taking you around it, but by taking you through it. Um. When I think about that prayer that I prayed a couple years ago, our son wasn't living with us. And initially that prayer was about wanting God to fix it. Um, I wanted God to get Tristan to where he was back in relationship with him. And I still pray that, and I still believe it's gonna happen. But then God was showing me that I needed to release Tristan to him 100% and that's really scary because then I don't have control of the outcome I needed it to be a safe outcome but literally after last week's message about submitting to God I realized that God wants me to yield this to him so that I can be stronger and so that I can serve God and so that God can use me to bring him glory whether our son finds his way back or not and right now he is not and he is not healthy and he is not living with us but I want God to use me and to use myself and my husband to glorify him in the midst of this I think excuse me I think God is still responding to the prayer that I prayed He showed us both that we weren't putting him first in our lives and in our marriage. We were taking each other for granted and not nurturing our marriage. He showed us that we need to make more time for date nights and that we need to pray together often. I've learned a few things in the last three years. I've learned that marriage takes work. Um, You can glide for a while without putting in any effort, but it's not something that would sustain. I've learned that everybody has peaks and valleys. 
I've learned that no marriage is perfect and that all marriages take work. I've learned that if there's something missing that you have to find it together. And I've learned that there's more to growing old together than just growing old together. God wants us to come to him and I'm learning that we stay in the battle because it's all worth it. Sometimes he delivers you by taking you through not out if you don't understand that then your entire relationship with God will always be frustrating for you if your theology does not make room for suffering and difficulty you will never be satisfied with God you will never understand the purpose of his glory Jesus was so overwhelmed with sorrow. Verse 38 of Matthew 26 tells us. He turns to his disciples and says, Stay here and keep watch with me. Can you imagine this moment for the disciples? They have seen Jesus cast out demons, heal the sick. He came walking to them on the water and it's like, Hey boys, settle down. And yet here he is, overwhelmed To the point of death. The smell, the feel of death is in the air. And he turns to them and says, Don't leave me. I need you to stay with me. Can you imagine what they must have felt in that moment? Even Jesus did not want to be alone in his worst moment. Even Jesus needed companionship from others. So he says, stay here with me. Don't don't leave me. There is a gift that God has given to us. You are in it today. It is called the church. Foolish is the man or woman who ever makes the statement, and that's why I left the church. You left the very thing that God gave you to get through life's worst moments because life was not meant to be done alone. That's why we have a principle called a shared experience. We need each other. And God gives us the incredible gift of being broken together to share our experiences together. And that's why it's so beautiful even when two girls who were scared to death to give their testimony can get together over coffee and share their broken stories and their tears and find the strength to testify to give God the glory about their weakness. Stay here with me. The way we stay here with each other, we pray with each other. We show up to prayer service. We show up to worship. We show up at the hospital. We make a phone call. We send an email. We make a meal. We do life together the beauty of the body is that we encounter life's worst moments not alone but together the reason I prayed what I prayed is because I never dealt with the loss of my brother I didn't deal with my parents not loving me enough. A loveless marriage, my first marriage, not having a relationship with my children. I came into this marriage not as a whole person. So I was never able to give myself to her the way I'm supposed to. So she walked out. She told me, you need to deal with your past or 
we're never going to go anywhere. So I prayed that. It's an ongoing prayer. I still work through it every day. We've gone to Christian counseling. We found a church, friends, family. And with all that, I've been able to forgive myself, forgive my parents. I, I believe in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to continue to believe in Jesus Christ. And with that, I know that our marriage is as strong as it's ever been. And it will continue to stay that way. As long as I have a church, family, and friends, and God to get me through what he needs to get me through. He's given me the strength. He's given me the courage. And I will continue to keep moving forward. On that night uh, at the hospital, I didn't realize it, but, but God did provide. It's, it's an unexplainable comfort. That, that he provided for me and direction and, and placed, even from that night, he placed people in our lives, uh, me and my children's lives that, that help us and still does, does today. And he, he also provided me with a, a beautiful wife that, that loves both me and my children now. And I'm, I'm grateful. Stay here. Keep watch with me. With me. Together. Verse 39 says, Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus prays, God, if there's any other way, he knows how overwhelming this, this is. He's not being disobedient. He's not abandoning the call, not abandoning his destiny. But the fullness of his humanity is on display here. The overwhelming nature of the moment is on display. And he's, he's just praying, being honest with God, just talking. God, if there's any other way. It's not that... I don't want to do it, but if there's any other way to do it. But even Jesus knows. The prophecy in Isaiah 53 verse 10, which says, It was God's will, the will of his Father, to crush him and to make him suffer. So that you and I would know salvation. And Jesus knows there would be no getting around it. For there would be, as Acts 4 says, no other name by which men or women must be saved. None but the name of Jesus. There was no other way. If there was another way, Jesus would have taken it in this moment. He could have said, let Buddha do it. Let Muhammad do it. Let Joseph Smith do it. But he didn't do that. There was no other name. Hear me. Hear me, in this secular age, when you hear people say, all roads lead to God, that is a lie. They do not. All roads do not lead to the same place. There is one way and one way only. And Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus discovered there would be no other way. Sometimes the only way is the way of the cross and the way of suffering. It was an internal struggle 
whether God allowed the miscarriages to happen or was it just a result of a fallen world. There's questions that I'll never have answers to. But I came to a point where I had to find a resolution and that was to depend on God for strength and for hope. I had to trust in His sovereignty and to have faith that He cares for me and to believe He wants the best for me no matter what. And I allowed God to, con- to heal my broken heart. It's a continuing process, and I may never understand what God is doing, but He is good. And after much prayer and consideration, Nathan and I had a peace not to try to have another child. We believe Lydia is a true miracle a gift from God, one beautiful child planned just for us. So now when I'm struggling with my faith or I'm struck with fear, I can remember how God is always there. He's always there no matter what, and he's going to see me through, and his plan is perfect. His ways are higher than our ways. Even when it's difficult, even when it doesn't make sense, I'd love it, Lord, if there was another way. But even if there's no other way, if I walk this road, I will trust you. Even when you say no. And sometimes God says no. Going a little farther, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father. If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Lord, I submit to your your will, but if there's another way, I want you to notice here. Even the Son of God does not have his prayer answered in the affirmative here. You notice that? God says, no, there is only one way. Sometimes God does not answer our prayers in the affirmative. Sometimes He does not answer them the way they are prayed. And what that provides is the platform for submission and surrender, the platform for our faith to grow and His glory to be shown. Now listen to me. If you do not understand this, you will always be frustrated in your relationship with God. You'll never be satisfied. So herein lies the purpose of Jesus' prayer. I want you to pay close attention. This is it. Last point right here. This is what, this is what you need to get. Don't miss this. Jesus knew the will of the Father. But his humanity is fully on display. He says, God, if there's any other way. But he knew there's no other way. So what is Jesus doing here? Is he trying to get himself out of this situation? No, actually what he's doing is submitting and surrendering himself to the situation through the process of prayer. Hear me now. You need to understand this. I want you to notice the progression of what's happening with Jesus' prayer. Matthew records that he prays three different times. First, he prays. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. You skip down to verse 42. And it says, he went away a second time and prayed. And then in verse 44, it says, he prayed a third time. Now, I want you to notice the repetition in Jesus' prayer. Here's, here's what I want first understand. This is why 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray continually. That's why Paul urged us, pray all the time. When you pray, pray again and then pray some more. The value of repetitive prayer. Persistent prayer. Why? So that you can get what you want? No, not necessarily. You might get what you want. God values that repetition. God values your persistence. That's why Jesus told a parable about the persistent widow. Be persistent. 
God may indeed grant it. But He may not. But what He's looking to grant is something even more important. And that's your submission to His will. Your surrender to His will because that, your alignment with His will because that's what's going to bring Him glory. And that's what's best for your life. We should thank God more sometimes for no than yes. If we could only see sometimes what we're praying for, what a blessing it is, He didn't answer in the affirmative that we desired. Notice the progression of Jesus' prayer here. Submission. First prayer. Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Committed to the process. Verse 42. He went away a second time and prayed. Now notice the slight difference in words. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. I want you to notice the evolution of the prayer. The process of the prayer. What's happening Submission, surrender, through the process of prayer. And verse 44 says, He went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Notice the process of submission that is happening through Jesus' prayer. Now he repeats the prayer, but it's changing as he prays it because he is aligning himself with the will of God. Notice that. Many of us, we think repetitive prayer is, okay, God, how about this, this, and that? Well, that didn't work, so we got to go back and we got to try harder. Or maybe we'll try a different angle. Maybe God didn't hear us. We'll pray something different. Guys, we got to get to, maybe we need to get more people. Maybe we, and, but that's not how Jesus is praying, his repeti- repetitious prayer. He's not saying that didn't work, so let me try a different angle. Uh, God, did you hear? We got to pray harder. That's not what's happening. The value of the persistent prayer, the value of the repetition is he is bringing himself into alignment with God. That's why you pray over and over again. Because as you pray, you call on him. He brings you into submission with his already revealed perfect will. You need to understand that the purpose and point of prayer is not to try to convince God to do what we want him to do, but rather to bring us into submission with His already revealed will in our lives. It's not about trying to trick God and convince Him to do something. It's about bringing us into alignment with His will. And that's what's happening in the garden. Jesus is bringing Himself into alignment with the perfect will of God. Beautiful. And Hebrews chapter 5 affirms that when it says... During the days of Jesus' life on earth, get this, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And the Bible says he was heard. That's really what we want. God, please hear me. Why was he heard? Because, here it is, of his reverent submission. See? The point of prayer is to bring us into submission. That's why we pray or make petition. Let me say it again. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries to the one who could save Him. And He was heard. Why? Because of His reverent submission. That's the point of prayer. It's not to trick God into getting Him to do what you want Him to do. It's to bring you into submission with His will for your life. Verse 8 in Hebrews chapter 5 says, Although he was a son, he was a son of God. He learned obedience from what he suffered. Learned? What do you mean? What? Jesus, the perfect son of God, what did he have to learn? Was he disobedient? That's not what that's saying there. Understand. 
He learned obedience from what he suffered. In other words, Jesus had to put himself through the fullness of the human experience so that we could have a God we could relate to. That's what made him the perfect high priest. That's what Hebrews is talking about. See, we don't have a God who can't relate. We don't have a God when we come to him and say, God, you don't know what this is like. He said, yes, I do. I submitted myself to it. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. What Jesus was doing is submitting himself fully to the human experience. Why? So that you and I might know the heavenly experience. That's why. A God who can relate. And what happened as a result of that? And once made perfect, perfection. You're, you realize that's the point of sanctification. God is making you perfect. That's why you're going through everything you're going through. He's making you perfect. He's preparing you for glory. There's something bigger at hand. That's why prayer is the process of submission. So once made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey Him. Meaning there was something bigger at hand. There is always something bigger at hand. Say it one more time. You need to understand. If you don't, you will always be frustrated with God. The point of prayer is not necessarily to convince Him to do what you want Him to do. Now, He might. He might. But He might not. Because he has something bigger in store. The point of prayer is to bring us into submission with God's will. That's why you pray. To bring us into alignment with his will. And when that happens, people who are lost and living for themselves who would never two years ago have gotten up in front of a church and testified about their weakness. When that happens, hard lives are broken and molded. When that happens, even when your child is raised the right way and they run totally against it and you have zero control, over the fact that they are destroying themselves daily, but you pray, you pray, you pray, and you trust. And then you testify so that others might be encouraged. When we submit to the process of prayer, marriages we thought that were once perfect, and one day we wake up and we realize we're just like everybody else in the battle. But being aware and taking the step to get in the fight is the first step to submission and a resurrected marriage. Yeah, you might not be done, but you're on the way. And you ain't giving up. Submission to the process of God's will. Is what enables you to even though God took your first wife, and I I don't mean take like God caused that to happen. I mean like the brokenness of this world, the brokenness of a messed up situation, and she's gone and you're left to tell your kids. But God takes and redeems and rebuilds that situation. And what happens is you have a guy who could have been like most, And said, okay, God, that's how you want to play it. Me and you are done. But 16 years later, he testifies about the event. Serves on the lead team of his church. He is the one who prepares the baptismal for people to get baptized and takes out the trash that you throw down on the ground every single Sunday. That's what happens. In the process of submission. And when you try desperately 
to have a baby. Something that seems so easy for so many, but yet you can't bring it to pass. Not once, twice, but three times. And yet you choose to trust the sovereignty of His will. And testify about that. Lead a life group that draws others into relationship with Him. You, you could have gone the other way so easy. You lead a life group. You prepare the e-blast. You run the lyrics that people offer their heartfelt worship to God for. That's what happens when you realize the point of prayer is submission to His will. He is not a genie in a lamp. He is a God who walks with us in relationship. So I ask you today, what is your overwhelming prayer that you're praying today? What's your, and if you don't have one, you should. That doesn't mean everything has to be broken in your life, then at the very least, you should be praying for the lost in this community. That could be your overwhelm. Take that one. If everything in your life is perfect, then take that one. Take all the opioid addicts that walk out in front of the church every day, back and forth between that motel over there and here. You can take that one if you don't have one. But odds are, you've got one. And odds are very high that for over half of you, nobody else knows about it but you. What is your prayer today? Where do you need to lay it down and submit? Is it your marriage? Is it your addiction? Is it your defiance of God? You can know Him today. Pastor Bill is here. Pastor Doug is here. They'll tell you how to begin a relationship with Jesus. Look to Him. Trust Him. And choose submission as you stand together